Thank now, you, you were with us before, um, back several months ago, talking about WAMU, and you guys were there. Yes, we were. Yes, we were. Look at the smiles on your faces. Did it have to fail? Um, for us and at us, all the branches we were at, um, we at the time we felt that it didn't at the time. No one was concerned of imminent failure. We were very concerned about being bought out, but we weren't concerned of imminent failure. In, in fact, our CEO, uh, Alan Fishman, who just came on board at the time, uh, as we go back to our last show, was, uh, at that time at the, of the seizure, it was kind of calm atmosphere. The CEO had just done a, a good job of assuring us that there was adequate liquidity and that we were well capitalized and that we could write out the crisis. So that's where we were at. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to go to a document that was filed. It was actually an affidavit that was filed in the uh, in the Delaware, which is where the Washington Mutual bankruptcy uh, is, the corporate bankruptcy. And this uh, affidavit is are actually the words of uh, a, an expert witness for uh, essentially the the chase interest as well so let's go let's go to the update the declaration itself here's what he, he says first based on my review to date there is no indication that the OTS that's office of thrift supervision right a government agency mm -hmm. performed a solvency analysis consistent with the test of insolvency specified in the bankruptcy code there's no indication that the o OTS assessed the fair saleable value of the assets of Washington Mutual let's go to the next part nor is there an indication that the OTS Compared the fair saleable value of the assets of Washington Mutual to the total amount of either company's respective liabilities, there's no indication that the OT, uh, OTS performed a comprehensive cash flow analysis. N and next in the last part, instead, the OTS found that Washington Mutual met the well-capitalized standards through the date of receivership. So, if I'm a, a shareholder of Washington Mutual, and I see this deal between the Feds and and J.P. Morgan Chase. Who can I trust in this? At at that time, you were looking for toward the to the UCEO and the board of directors to put out a plan for recovery, and I think that's what was in place. And as I said, there was a feeling of certainty that the CEO had some kind of plan in place for the recovery. And um, at the time of the seizure, on the day of the seizure. It's, I think it's uh, fair and accurate to say not only the employees of the bank, but management was surprised, caught off guard by the actions of the OTS. Well, based on, uh, on that declaration right there, there um, it was solvent. And uh, there's, it's definitely questionable, and maybe that will come through that litigation or some other litigation. Who knows? Now let's go to a statement of Ben Bernanke uh, of the Fed. He said, lax oversight has caused the crisis. Bernanke said, let's go to the quote. This is January the 4th out of the New York Times. When historical relationships are taken into account, it is difficult to ascribe the house price bubble either to monetary policy or to the broader uh, macroeconomic environment. So you guys are, have been in that environment. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was it that caused all this? Well, as far as interest rates, um, while it wasn't the cause, it definitely played a role. When uh, interest rates dropped, a lot of people started coming into the banks looking for mortgages. So as the consumer demand increases, of course, then businesses by nature are going to look f to capitalize on that. And what banks, including Washington Mutual, did, all banks, lending institutions alike, uh, is uh, ease their credit uh, and borrowing requirements. Um, traditionally, there was an 80% loan to value requirement. Everybody uh, knows the 20% out payment magic number. But what happened during this uh, low interest rate period is that uh, banks were actually doing 110% loans. Um, so that's while interest rates played a role, it itself wasn't the problem. But didn't the banks know that if interest rates were going down and they were low 110% uh, on housing, that that is going to artificially increase the price of housing? I mean, yeah. that's basic, right? Yes, but that's not what their concern was. Each bank is mostly concerned about their own profits, and as well, they probably should be. Banks are a highly regulated industry mm -hmm. for a reason. Mm -hmm. They're crucial to the United States or any country's economy. We are regulated, our banks are regulated by the Federal Reserve. And so the regulator and, and a few other government agencies, but basically the Fed. Office of Thrift Supervision. Yeah. Not, according to. <laughs> well, well, just not, kidding. Not, not with one word, anyway. <laughs> um, but the, the Fed itself, um, Alan Greenspan stated in 2005, I believe, 
that there's no way that housing prices can go down significantly. So he didn't think it was a problem. He was the chief regulator, at least in, in terms of policy. He never thought it was a problem. Each bank was going to do what they thought was in their best interest and was in their best interest of their shareholders and maybe their own, the way that the compensation is structured, their own. So the, these banks, the, the national banks, the banks that now our TARP money has gone to, our taxpayer dollars has gone to, they exist essentially in a silo looking at themselves. They don't see themselves as part of a broader system. Well, you, in, in this case, not, not really. I mean, if you're the CEO of a bank, your first duty is to your shareholders. Mm -hmm. And somewhat second duty is to your employees. But your first duty is to your shareholders. It's not to United States public policy. That's why you have a regulator. For example, to use kind of a silly analogy, but if you're playing football, right, your duty is to win that game, not to play by the rules necessary. That's why you have referees and umpires. The Fed needed to be a referee and umpire that came was a little more active. So it sounds like then that if you can if you can be the best cheater, then you can win the game. Yeah, another element is that You said it, I did. <laughs> <laughs> another element is that the compensation structure Eric alluded to is the, the bonus system in the US, which is primarily the, the main comp for execs, based on year over year and quarterly performance. So um, while um, shareholder interests are fundamentally the primary um, responsibility of the CEO, really it also indirectly, it directly impacts their compensation as well, and which is measured by performance. Well, if I'm investing in a solvent bank, which according to the Office of Thrift Supervision, WAMU was, and then all of a sudden I see the Fed swoop in, get a, get a deal with uh, another entity, and that other entity takes over the asset and some of the liabilities, but mostly the assets, and then I, my, the value of my shares is zero. I mean, who do I go after? That's a good question. And we'll leave it at that. We're going to take a very short break. Uh, we're talking with Dan Um and Eric uh, Johnson. They are expert financial advisors from Ameriprise Financial. Uh, you can uh, reach them. Uh, well, the name of the firm is um, uh, um Johnson & Associates. The website is going to be up on the screen on the next slide. And also, there are some financial seminars. And these are free seminars that are of an education standpoint. They're coming up. First one is January 27th, the Roth IRA conversions. Second one is February 24th, very, very important, Social Security and medical benefit, Medicare benefits. Third is March 31st, Tax Smart Investing. So you can uh, go to the uh, phone number or to the email address up on the screen, find out more information. Again, these are free. Go and learn about your own finances, and you're going to want to.